Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another show on History Vibe Podcast. Today, I'm live with Dr. Samuel Zinner and James Valiant. Today, we're going to be discussing, did Josephus write the testimony of Flavianum, and how did he understand Jesus? So thank you both for joining me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having us. So, you know, well, go ahead, James. Go ahead. Well, you know, uh, obviously the testimonium, the Jesus passage, at least, uh, uh, there's some controversy about the James passage in the antiquities, but it, it's not nearly so criticized as the uh, Jesus passage uh, in Josephus's antiquities. Uh, and it is generally thought by most scholars to have been interpolated, in fact, heavily interpolated. There may well have been an original reference. In fact, the James reference may imply that there was a Jesus reference by itself, but many scholars are very skeptical about the contents of the testimonium. And the normal, normal position is that it is such fulsome praise of Jesus, that it is so positive uh, that it contains specifically Christian material that we would have to believe that Josephus was some sort of Christian or sympathetic to Christianity if he really authored all, all of the, the passage. The passage contains remarkable, what, what appears to most people in translation at least, and even to many who are familiar with the ancient Greek, to be a very fulsome praise of Jesus. Uh, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, which seems to open up the idea of his divinity, or that he's more than mortal at least. Um, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. That would seem to imply that he's endorsing Jesus's teachings. And he won over many of the Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ. Now that it seems to be an outright uh, uh, description of Jesus as the Christ by our uh, historian Josephus. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then, of course, he won over many uh, Jews, many of the Greeks. That seems to be aware of the Pauline mission, in fact. Um, furthermore, and when, uh, upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to the cross, uh, those who had first come to love him did not cease. So he's got this enduring love. Again, it seems very positive. Um, uh, did not cease. He appeared to them, spending a third day restored to life. For the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. This would seem to specifically say he's the fulfillment of Hebrew prophecy. And the tribe of Christians, the, the clan of Christians, so called after him as still to this day not disappeared. Um, I, because of our earlier conversations, I know this is a long question, I'm sorry to go on, but because of our earlier conversation of, about Ulrich Victor's work, you had me rethinking this and rethinking this in the original Greek. Is this, in fact, an unmitigated positive uh, assertion on Josephus's part as it normally comes across in translation? You're asking Jacob or me? <laughs> you, 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 sir. Dr. Zinner, please. Well, all right. Well, I'll, I'll start off then by saying that uh, Ulrich Victor's uh, German language essay, right, which was published in 2010 in the Novum Testamentum journal, uh, I don't necessarily agree with everything he says. I'm inclined to uh, agree with with almost every point that he makes. Um, but I bring your attention to um, a quite lengthy article in English also. Right. And that was uh, published in the Journal for the Study of Judaism in 2014. And it's by this really wonderful scholar. I, I really like his work. Unfortunately, for those who don't know Spanish, uh, most of his work is in Spanish. And I'm, I'm talking about Fernando Bermejo Rubio. And uh, this essay I'm bringing your attention to is called Was the Hypothetical Forlaga of the Testimonium Flavianum, a neutral text, challenging the common wisdom on Antiquitates uh, Judaici, 1863-64. So his argument uh, in, in this essay, uh, which runs from what, page 326 to 300, 
65, I believe, so it's, it's pretty lengthy, is uh, he's addressing the claim of, uh, of quite a few scholars, probably, I don't know if it's a majority, but quite a few who tend to believe that <clears throat> this passage was interpolated and that the original passage um, was neutral, right? So it just had the, a, it was neither positive nor negative. Which is neutral. A lot of scholars believe, right, that uh, the the what they think of the uh, the original version of the testimonium would have been a neutral text, neither condemning Jesus uh, nor really um, saying much positive about it. just neutral, just neutral, right? So um, uh, everyone who's interested in this should read uh, Fernando's article, and I'm bringing attention to it because. Uh, some of the points I'll be making tonight, right, you'll be able to find them in that article. And the, they're very helpful because of the parallel passages, right, in Josephus that he supplies. All right, let's start right off the bat. Uh, no, I don't necessarily plan on going through the entire testimony, even though I, I could do it. But let's start off with the first line, and we're going to learn a lesson here in uh, how Josephus uses language and how I think most scholars just are totally oblivious to, to what the text as we have it is, is saying. Uh, all right, so, genetai uh, dikata tuton ton kronon Jesus tis. Now this tis, uh, a certain Jesus, this tis has fallen out of a lot of the manuscripts, right? And, uh, and, and uh, but Mejo Rubio makes a good point, right? Why would it fall out? Because it, it has, uh, as opposed, let's see, it could have fallen out or it could have been added, right? But uh, it makes most sense that it has fallen out. Why? Because it, in Josephus, it has a negative ring to it often, right? So um, this certain person, right? Uh, so guy, <laughs> right? it's, it's usually contemptuous, and, uh, and and this this phrase, the first two words, genetai uh, day. The, uh, and on, right? It doesn't mean uh, at that time they're lived, right? In in some neutral sense, at that time they're lived, right? Especially with this tis. Now, if you look at antiquities, 18310, 2118, 2173, and the, the war, 199, 1648-4208, you'll see that in all those passages, this idiom is used by Josephus. Uh, to introduce or to begin the narrations about Jewish uh, rebels and and tumults, right? So uh, right off the bat, um, you can see that the, there's something negative. Even even the very this particle tis, right, uh, right, it ha has has a negative uh, connotation throughout the antiquities and throughout the, the Jewish war. And, and also, I, I point out really quickly there, since some scholars uh, have said this, you know, why would uh, a Christian use this phraseology that, that uh, he's later on as well, which is usually translated, and he was the Christ, or why wouldn't they say he is? Well, this language that Josephus is using, it's in the past tense because he's narrating events from decades previous, right? So that's really uh, sort of a red herring argument. It's, it's really so a Christian neither is here nor there. That is the Christ. Yeah, uh, I want to ask about that. A little no, more. So it's just he's narrating, he's a historian, he's narrating events that happened decades ago. So he's using the tense in Greek, which is referring to the past. Right. We we can when when we if you want to we can get to that that particular passage uh, now or a little later. But you know, because there's a lot more to be said about really what's going on there. Uh, yes, Jacob. I see you want to ask something. I was just adjusting my microphone, but yeah. Um, uh, the Greek word that Josephus uses and uh, when he refers to Christ or just before he gets to the word Christ or Christos is. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Eton was so it's, it's like oh he says was Christ but the, the, it feels like to me that a lot of people are treating that as if it 
that Josephus is saying is Christ, even though that's not uh, the, the Greek word he's using there doesn't mean is. He's using uh, the Greek word eton was. And so he's referring to Christ in, in past tense. And that's kind of odd because why would a why would a Christian put that into Josephus? Yeah, if, if, and, 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 and try to suggest that oh he was a Christ like it's like he no as if he no longer is at present. Mm -hmm. Because you you will find this usage throughout Josephus, just not here. It's just a simple uh, fact of Greek grammar. He's referring to events and people who existed decades ago. And so he's referring to them in the past tense. That's all that's going on. So it's neither here nor there. What for, uh, uh, for the question of uh, is this original? Would this be a Christian sentiment? Would this be a Jewish sentiment? Would be a would be a, would it be positive, negative? It's neither here nor there. That aspect of it is just simple Greek. You find it all throughout Josephus or any Greek language uh, historian who's writing about events and people. Uh, from ages past or decades past. And so this this is quite a few decades after uh, Jesus lived, right? And so that's just, there's nothing unusual about that. So I have heard some scholars make that argument, but uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know if it's just, uh, they fall into apologetics or is ignorance of Greek, uh, I'm not quite sure. Could it be the term Christ? Because we, it, since Josephus uses it uniquely, it seems, uh, for Jesus in the James and uh, passage and in the um, uh, Jesus passage, it's a sort of unique term here. And we, after, you know, conditioned by Christianity of the last 2000 years, if he's saying the term Christ, it's more than just a title he had, but it could have just been referring to a title that was used for Jesus. What's going on, uh, and, th and this is a point that Ulrich Victor makes, and and it makes sense uh, also, right? you can think even to this day, right, if if a group of Jews are sitting around talking about uh, Jesus, you, you know, what are they going to call him, Yeshua, Yeshka, or whatever. Um, uh, uh, and uh, also, let's say, uh, scholarship, modern scholarship written by Jews, Jewish scholars, we're referred to Jesus Christ, right? Because that's what the 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 world, right? That's that's how he's known, right? So that's how you refer to him, right? So well, or Victor makes this point, too, right? and it's true, and it works not only in in Greek and ancient Greek, especially, but in many other languages. That personal names take the definite article. So when he, he's so the so you shouldn't translate what Josephus is saying in that line as he was the Christ. He is using Christos there, how Christos as a, a personal name because that's how it was being used at the time in, in the Christian community and um, you know the parlance that was spreading out from there, right? So uh, he's saying he's talking about. Um, this guy named Jesus or Jesus, right, which is this uh, uh, Hebrew name, and he's writing, he's not writing to Jews, he's writing to pagans, he's writing to a pagan uh, audience, right, and so he's talking about, he introduces this man named Jesus, and so then in mid-course he says, uh, what he's saying is, oh, by the way, this this Jesus I'm talking about, or this Jewish son, this is the guy that you hear about so much, Christ, as a name. So he's referring, he's using Christ there as a personal name because that's the way it was being used by Greek followers uh, of Jesus, right? In 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 the uh, say that, like the Pauline trajectory, especially, right? So anyway, that's what uh, Victor's uh, argument and. It makes perfect sense, right? In light of the entire testimonium and all of the negative valences that the that the uh, that the that the grammar and vocabulary have, which which we can go through. What do we make more of, of that? Um, what, what do we make of the passage that says, "Those who received truth gladly," as it's normally translated? Gladly, what's the uh, uh, come on? How we, uh, you know the Greek there is edon, and which is cognate to the the English word hedonistic, or hedonism, right? So it has in 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 Josephus it has a very 
uh, contemptuous, a very negative meaning. And then let me see here. I have my notes. Uh, where else can you find it? Antiquities 18.6. So not too far away, right? Yet there was one Judas. Right? Uh, and, he, and he goes on. Right? Um, his name was uh, Gamalim, taking with him a Sadiq, a Pharisee, he became zealous to draw them to a revolt, who both said that this taxation was no better. Uh, anyway, so it's another tumult, it's another rebel. So men received what they said with pleasure. Kai Edone, Gartin, well, I'll spare you the rest of the Greek. It's the same language that he's using uh, in a nearby passage. Right, and so this oh, gladly accepted, right? Well, hedonistically, right, is what he's saying, and um, and and this this phrase also about teaching, right? This uh, all right. So, here, here's a little line from uh, Bermejo Rubio in the 16 occurrences of uh, Didis Kalos in Josephus, almost half of them, uh, the word has a negative meaning by referring to false teachers. Right, half um, of them, yeah, um, and also in the latter part of antiquities, carrying negative overtones, particularly to refer to the tumultuous behavior of crowds, right? And so, anyway, this this edone gladly, right? It has this; it's a pejorative uh, valence uh, in Christian literature, also not only in Josephus, right? And uh, so it's, it's, it's like uh, Bermejo Rubio says, th th this, this can't be a Christian interpolation. So Christian's not going to use this terminology. So with pleasure could just mean these people sucked it up and enjoyed it. It's not yes. evaluating the uh, truth or falsehood or quality of the teachings. It's saying that these people sucked it up with joy. <laughs> That's right. And, and like I said, the, in Antiquities 18.6, right, this is, it, it's, it's applied to these uh, uh, seditious people. But uh, also uh, Antiquities 1870, 1885, um, right, so, um, right, so if one takes the time to find the parallels uh, to, to these turns of phrase, uh, uh, throughout, throughout Josephus, the antiquities, and also in, in the Jewish War, right? One one can right document right how sometimes always right some of these terms have negative valence, and sometimes as they said, like sometimes like half of them are going to have this right, and so it's the it's the typical uh, language that Josephus uses when he's going to introduce. Uh, seditious stories, stories of, of, of rebels that he doesn't like, uh, and tumults, right? which, is, which is what everything is before and after this passage, by the way. Right. He introduces the whole section as, and among the tumults, and uh, presumably Jesus is among these tumults and disasters. Yeah. Well, the, the language that he uses... Uh, Right, uh, has a lot of the same terms that we find in the passages before and after and throughout the antiquities and, and the Jewish war, right? So, um, as far as far as the wise man who you know should we yeah. even call him a man, Ulrich Victor? I mean, that's that's some of the easier stuff to deal with, right? Because this is all phrases from uh, from from ancient Greek literature uh, that's used sometimes even of. Uh, in parody, but sometimes even of uh, fi figures who were looked down upon, right? So, I mean, even in English, you know, uh, we have probably some close cognates. Um, I, uh, I, I forget a lot of my English idioms uh, not living in, in America. Uh, like a wise head or... or uh, wise guy. Right? Wise guy, there. Thank a you. Smart aleck. Yeah. So a yeah, smart aleck, yeah, right. So I mean, it can be used used in that sense. And um, but you know, a lot of people who think that this might be a neutral text uh, sometimes will say, "Well, yeah, he's, he's a, so, a sophos aner, right?" But there's something Ulrich Victor pointed out: sophos aner. Josephus never uses that 
anywhere else of a Jew. Right. So it's it's uh, you know if if you add it uh, you know if you take it if you add it to everything else, right? Um, in this testimonial, um, I, I you know it, I I think it I, I think it just falls into place, right? So, um, and if we were to call him a man, this is a, a, an attested uh, ancient Greek idiom. You're going to find it in Greek literature. And it's, I'm not aware, um, let's see, it's, it's, it's not used of gods, right? Even St. John Chrysostom uses that phrase, even if we, uh, of Elijah, I believe it is, right? So it's just for anyone out of the ordinary, whether they're, pos whether they're thought of positively or negatively, right, can be, uh, you know, this kind of language, if indeed we ought to call him a man. Right, we find that like even in the, um, I don't know if anyone's really noticed this, but like in the infancy gospel of Thomas, right, where the little Jesus boy, right, is being bad and, and killing and resurrecting people. Uh, but, you know, the uh, Jews in the text use this phrase, you know, uh, you know the t I think it's the teacher maybe, who, s who says maybe to his father Joseph, says like, I don't even know if, I, if we should call him a human being. Right, and so it's not meant positively, right? Um, and in fact, the way the, the 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 phrase itself, he's not saying he's not taking a position on what Jesus is. He's opening the question, and it could be at most a neutral statement, uh, and or it could have even a negative valence, in which case uh, he's allowing the reader. To think this guy is just a man, but people believed he was more than a man. He's, Josephus himself is really not making a statement. He's leaving it open to the reader at the very least. Well, then the, then the next statement that he goes on to is Kaipolus um, nen Iudaius Polus de Kaitu. Right, anyway, uh, the verb that he now uses here, it's used, um, how, how is it usually? So, uh, but uh, if, if you look in your Greek lexica, you don't have to make an emendation to understand this verb as meaning leading astray. So he led many, he led astray many Jews and many of the Greeks. Uh, so uh, how is it usually translated, or I should say mistranslated? Samuel, um, I want to ask about uh, organ of Alexandria. Because he seems mm -hmm. to be upset somewhat at Josephus for the way uh, Josephus talks about Jesus, uh, talked about Jesus. Um, mm -hmm. Could uh, I know? I know Oregon doesn't make a direct reference to the testimonium, but the testimonium kind of reminds me a little bit of the way uh, uh, Josephus wrote the James passage when he says Jesus uh, was the Christ or or was called the Christ in the James passage. Could the could the past tense of that was Christ? And yes, I know you pointed out earlier about. Joseph is saying was eaten is a common word he uses throughout his text. Yes. But could Oregon have uh, taken offense at the at, at the past tense language there? Because in his view, it would be he is the Christ. What do you mean he was? Is it, it's possible, but I don't think it's probable. I mean, you know, Origen was a Greek speaker. I think that he understood what Josephus was saying, and this is why he didn't like what Josephus said about Jesus. Right. And so I would say that in the James passage, you say, "Oh, uh, who, who's the the brother of the one who's who's who was called or who is called Christ?" Again, it's not being used as a messianic title; it's being used as a personal name because he's writing to Greek-speaking uh, pagans right? who who have no idea what Christos would mean in Jewish theology, and he uh, and if he wanted to convey that to them, he would have had to he would have to gloss it. As he, as he does sometimes with Hebrew words or Hebrew concepts or Jewish concepts, right? Because he's writing to non-Jews, so he has to explain a lot of these, right? Which incidentally, those those glosses are not usually present in like the Slavonic Josephus. But anyway, that's that's another subject. But uh, so no, I, I think uh, I think this explains why a lot of early Christian authors uh, are silent about this passage. I mean, the, they will be offended by it. So what you're exactly so someone like Oregon, 
you're, what you're saying is that the the passage could have been read in a negative way or uh, even in, in just a neutral way but either of those would have been enough to upset a christian like oregon mm, perhaps uh, i'm 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 a little doubtful about that but i think origin is you know a, a really critical thinker and he knows his greek i think he knew what josephus was saying and, and and he didn't like it and if josephus had said something neutral i mean i don't think origin would would have been offended at that because he knows he would have noted he would have recognized the genre this is history right so you know we you know, if he's talking about Jesus, he doesn't have to doesn't have to expect him to 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 get on the soapbox and start preaching. But right. as far as you're concerned, Oregon is reading Josephus in a largely negative way. He's not <laughs> seeing, he's reading him as saying, "Yes, this is the Christ who rose on the third day, and he's more than a man." At all, he's seeing the Greek idioms for what they are and reading it as it can be in a negative way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, by the way, this this Greek verb that I'm talking about that uh, can mean lead astray, right? Uh, epagumai, right? You can find that with that negative valence in Antiquities 1, 207, 6, 196, 11, 199, 17, 327. So there again, I mean, look at uh, the other passages where Josephus uses uh, the, the, the same language and, and you start to see a pattern. So these three phrases are very frequently used in a negative sense by Josephus. Each of these phrases is at least sometimes, if not half the time or more, used in a negative way by Josephus. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Um, and especially in, in nearby passages or, or similar stories, right? similar, similar types of stories. And, of course, you know, Origen... And Theodoret, and there were others, right? They tell us in the writings that Josephus did not believe Jesus was the, the, the Christ. Right? And so, right, that can be interpreted, uh, you know, it has been interpreted in, in two different ways, right? The main way that's just, well, then the, this must be an interpolation, right? Right, that's, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is, well, no, that's not what uh, the text even says now. Right, it's clearly he didn't believe that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, right? As if the Greeks could uh, uh, care about that at all, right? But um, but he's certainly but, not saying that Jesus is the is this thing. See, w most scholars, w when they read it, they they're taking it as asserting uh, Christian doctrine. But actually, Josephus is not asserting the truth of Christian doctrine. This could be read in an entirely neutral or negative way. You know, so yeah, so when he says uh, how Christos utas uh, ain, right? Uh, th this is to be translated, right? So you could paraphrase it. He, right? The previously mentioned Jesus I've been talking about. He was, he was this guy named Christ that you you're hearing about, right? So using it as a personal name, not how Christos is the Christ, the Messiah, but as a personal name, right? Um, so it's it's not a stretch to interpret it that way, uh, in light of the language that's coming comes before and comes after it, uh, and the negative valences that, this, that these these idioms and phrases or or, or verbs have elsewhere, um, in Josephus. Right now, there, there's a point that uh, that Fernando makes right with that next line. Um, about Pilate condemning him, right? Uh, I'll quote, it is significant that we do not find here even a small hint of criticism directed toward the rulers. So this is just reportage here, right? It's, it's more than reportage because he's, he, he has a negative animus. But uh, in, in a certain sense, he's just, this is reportage, this is what happened. So he's not criticizing the Jewish rulers or Pilate, right? Because he says the accusation of the principal men among us, so the Jews and Pilate, right? So, it, so he's not criticizing, he's reporting what's going on, right? Um, so uh, those who had first come to, to be attached to him 
did not cease. All right, so let, let me read you a little line here uh, from Fernando. In, in the Jewish War 1, 171, it is stated that Aristobulus becomes the cause of troubles because he gathered many Jews. The last expression is a close parallel, even in the time indication. Right. So uh, now the significant thing is that, as Eisler remarked, it is hardly plausible that what Josephus meant is that those men gathered by Aristobulus really loved a man like him, and this should make us doubt that what he meant in antiquities was something truly positive. Apart from the possible meaning of the verb in Josephus and from this parallel, there is a further reason that the verb in the testimonium does not seem to have the idyllic meaning of love, but rather a slightly ironical and derogatory meaning. As several scholars have remarked, the whole phrase, right, kai auton, uh, agape santes has a concessive meaning. Despite the fact that Jesus had been condemned to crucifixion, other people did not cease to be attached to him. Given the obvious negative significance of crucifixion, what Josephus conveys is rather the idea that Jesus' followers put their commitment on the wrong track, unquote. So, uh, you know, there's, there's no emendation needed to get there. Right. right. What do we make of the third day thing? Uh, all, all right. That reminds me. Uh, I should make a point. Right. So uh, it seems to me that a lot of early Christian authors did not care for to engage with the testimonium because it was negative. So just ignore it. On the other hand, I do think that there's evidence that some of them did because uh, the right. We can use a strategy. Right. Someone can use a strategy uh, to turn something negative uh, and, and use the enemy's tools. Right. This, I, I think, you know, a phrase from Shakespeare. <coughs> um, so that did happen. And, uh, and, and we'll talk about in, that in a little bit. It's, it's quite fascinating. But what you're talking about there is uh, when he says he appeared to them spending a third day, that's how we would translate it literally, right? Um, uh, restored to life. All right, so uh, Fernando now. The inclusion of autois gives um, Ephane, uh, they appear a subjective cast so that the oratio oblica could be dispensed with. In other words, it's not an affirmation, it's an indirect discourse, as, and it's a belief to be dismissed, right? Again, you don't have to amend the text to get there, right? And now, the, um, all right, now another thing he points out, quote, the genitive absolute construction, and this is a, for the divine prophets, right? Ton theon propheton, right? So not the prophets of God, but the divine prophets. He's writing to Greeks, so he's using non-Jewish language here. The, the, the Greeks would talk about divine prophets, right? Um, but he says, for the divine prophets have foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him, right? So the genitive absolute construction conveys different meanings and one not necessarily with which the writer agrees, right? And that's something that, you know, if, if you've studied Greek, you should know that, right? Scholars should know that. So it's a possibility. It's a possibility, right? A textbook, grammar, uh, you don't have to amend anything or, or stretch. You go, have to go by the context. And I think the context here uh, will lead us to this direction. Yeah, this is one of those instances where you don't have affirmation, uh, but you have some kind of indirect discourse that you're going to dismiss. Right? Like in German, right, they have the subjunctive mode. You report someone's belief, right, and it's phrased uh, grammatically distinctively, right? So, you know. And uh, so you can see that it's in the subjunctive. So it's not necessarily meaning that the reporter agrees with it. It's just reporting what was said, right? So it's going to be in the subjunctive case. But it's so why is it similar. good sense? Someone familiar with, you know, Koine idioms should be able to see that this could be read in a negative or neutral way. Why is it that uh, so many scholars are convinced people who know Koine Greek, that this is obviously a Christian interpolation because it's such fulsome praise. Because as you pointed out, it, the passage as it reads could be negative or it could be at best neutral, and yet they always interpret it as being Christian doctrine. 
Uh, the order of Victor, I think, gives a good explanation for that, right? So it's, it's really in, in relatively modern times that scholars began to doubt the authenticity of the testimonial, right? And so, right, it's, I, I guess uh, part of it is the age of skepticism, perhaps. Also, uh, I, I hate to say it, but a decline in knowledge and the, the quality of knowledge, but also, right, there are fine Greek scholars, right, who, who are convinced this is all interpolation. But I think that most of them, right, have not taken into account only these parallels, right, that uh, Fernando in his essay ha has supplied. Because once you start, right, putting uh, two and two together and seeing how these, uh, these terms of phrases, uh, the, these uh, verbs and idioms are used elsewhere, I fill in the blank, right? It, you know, it, uh, you know, Ulrich Victor's paper begins to look more convincing, right? And um, anyway, so the, the let's, let's deal with the last line there. The tribe of the Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. Before I comment on that, what's the very next sentence? Oh, about the same time, also another sad calamity put the Jews into disorder. Why would a Christian interpolate something like this right there? Right. Uh, or why wouldn't they just remove it and put it somewhere else? Right. Uh, and why did they put it in a place that seems to suggest through the chronology that Jesus died before John the Baptizer? Right. So that's uh, that's uh, why would Christians put it there in this particular place when uh, it may or may not be the case that what Josephus is it, but it really looks like that's what's that's the impression that reading the text gives, right? Prima facie. But anyway, um, the, well, this is really fascinating to me because someone like Oregon, who obviously knows the language and lives with it in a way that people today don't live with the language, could read this entirely negatively and come away thinking Josephus is being totally negative about. Uh, Jesus. Uh, that's fascinating. Well, the tribe, okay, no, the, this word tribe, I know a lot of people have talked about it, Yeah. Right. which, which is here in the case of uh, Fulon, right? Uh, Fernando, let's quote him, a Fulon can be used by Josephus in a neutral sense, but the word usually, so in most cases, has a pejorative sense, right? So the argument according to which its meaning must have been neutral Right, because of the expression "toton Christian uh, fulon," is also used by Eusebius of Christians, is unsound, given that Eusebius uses this expression simply because it appears in a text where he is paraphrasing Tertullian's Apology two six seven, which he knew in a Greek translation. Thus, he uses some vocabulary of the source he is discussing. Otherwise, the meaning of the term is, in his works, overwhelmingly negative. Right. And uh, moreover, the words uh, do not convey uh, a neutral meaning, uh, you know, have not yet disappeared, do not convey a neutral meaning, but rather a disappointed assessment. The Christian sect, though not yet extinct, is on its way towards a natural death. Haven't stamped them out yet. So it almost has a negative connotation, or at least a connotation that could be negative. Well, the fuel on, right, uh, is usually pejorative. Yeah. Right, in Josephus, right? Not and, uh, pejorative. Um, it, it usually is, right? So the majority of times. So if we were going to use his normal pattern, we'd interpret it negatively as Oregon may well have. Right, right. So there's, there's a, right, so I think that uh, Ulrich Victor's uh, essay um, and on uh, Uh, I, I always like to be charitable. Um, you know, I have I have had discussions with some scholars, and unfortunately, they, did, they weren't able even to read the German, right? So I had to lead them by the hand through it. But anyway, um, I can see uh, a lot of uh, Greek scholars reading Ulrich Victor's essay and coming to the conclusion, let's say that, yeah, um, maybe I can't, agree with one, two, three of the points, but but the the over the, the majority of his points yeah, they, they actually make sense. And I think they're buttressed by you know all the all this uh, parallel 
parallels uh, this this data that uh, uh, Fernando has put together. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, what I wanted to point out before I forget is that, um, right, so, so it's also the case that I think early Christians could see the testimony and, and sort of want to um, use it uh, to try to take the sting out of it, so rework it. But why would that be the case anyway? Why would they want to do that? Not because of the testimony by itself, but because they were using other uh, passages from Josephus. So let's not neglect that one. Is with, and I'm talking about Luke, right? So we know Luke used the Antiquities, right? I think so. <laughs> well, we know Steve Mason, uh, several other scholars, right, have pointed that out. But now there's, uh, I think, at least for scholars, there's a famous essay uh, written by Gary J. Goldberg, right? So the coincidences or coincidences. Um, the coincidences of the Imas narrative of Luke and the testimonium of Josephus. All right, so there's 1998, yeah. the journal for the study of the pseudepigrapha. It's been out there. He demonstrates a, a literary um, uh, relationship between the story of Imas, right, this famous story of the Gospel of Luke, and the testimonium. And he posits a common source, right, which I would say is a violation of Occam's razor uh, in this instance. Because Luke uses, because we know Luke uses the antiquities elsewhere, I think in the gospel and also in Acts, uh, everyone I think knows that he uses it in Acts. Um, and there's so, a similarity that would give us every reason to believe Luke is taking the language itself from Josephus. That's all right. So, but, but what's what's the takeaway from that? That is, we have Luke here, uh, which is dated variously. I dated you know, 115, 120, uh, you know, so later than most scholars, I think, in the field would. But anyway, uh, this shows you that already, right, early second century, somewhere around 115 to 120, the 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 uh, the testimonium existed, in more or less. Right, uh, the the form that we have it, right? Because the the number of the parallels comes from almost <laughs> right every uh, portion of it, at least, right? And so one that just has to read Gobert's essay uh, to see all that evidence. So it uh, the the it's not the simplest, right? Occam's razor is not well the simplest explanation suffices. No, it's uh, Occam's razor is not to unnecessarily multiply essences, right? Necessarily, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so sometimes uh, the facts are quite complicated. It's not the simplest explanation. It's quite complicated, right? Uh, but it's uh, we don't want to use, we, we don't want to create sources or essences. We don't want to create sources uh, if it's not necessary. And here it's not necessary. We know that Luke has uh, used the antiquities elsewhere. So if there is a literary relationship between uh, the story of Amos right, and the testimonium, then all right, uh, the, the uh, most lucid explanation is that, well, yet again, uh, he's uh, availing himself of Josephus, right? But anyway, the takeaway is that in the early second century or whenever one wants to date Luke, uh, the testimonium, more or less as it is now, right, uh, existed, right? And so this is, of course, one reason why we can't so we date have, Luke early. You're right. Yeah. So we have no reason from the language of the testimonium to believe that, in fact, uh, it was a positive pro-Christian uh, reference. It could be neutral or negative, could be read in that light, seems to have been read in a negative light by Oregon, which it could be. And since the language itself appears in the Emmaus passage in Luke, we have every reason to believe that the uh, testimonium is itself accurate, as is. Yeah, and um, uh, another point um, I think is that in uh, Bermejo Rubio's, Fernando uh, Bermejo Rubio's essay, uh, Victor, uh, Ulrich Victor's arguments, I think, about um, the, should, should, if we should even call him a man 
and maybe the thing about uh, all the deeds that he did, he's uh, he's he's not convinced by uh, Victor's argumentation. I am, but I'm, I'm just uh, filling you in here. So he so right so, but I think on many of the points um, he, he he does agree. And um, but you yourself see no reason to doubt the testimony. Of no. Uh, in fact, uh, there, there are many scholars, I, I think, who would agree with me. Uh, with me. I, I have to say that uh, I, I think it's authentic, not because I have some dogmatic reason to, uh, God forbid. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, I like, uh, I know there are some, uh, and again, I don't want to criticize, but there are some mythicists who um, it, uh, may have a need for this not to be authentic, right? Not all of them, but I know there are some who probably do fall under that. But, but um, when you read their arguments about the James passage, you can definitely tell that they're straining to with an agenda to get to read Jesus out of the text of antiquities altogether. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's, it seems to be like some kind of uh, it's like some uh, a bias, uh, right? Uh, 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 an opinion that's there, right? Whereas with me, right, uh, years ago, right, I was raised thinking that the uh, testimonium was, you know, largely interpolated. But it was Ulrich Victor's essay that changed my mind. I, I have right. to admit to you, in my own book, uh, Creating Christ, I take the standard position that the uh, testimonium was at least enhanced and interpolated. You've got, given, given you, sir, are the one who directed me to articles which have caused me to rethink my position altogether. Uh, well, the, the context is important too, right? And I don't think that, uh, the, I, I think there are many scholars who don't really appreciate the context. They may know, oh yeah, let's, let's see. What immediately precedes and immediately follows the testimonium, right, is, is negative. Yeah. But there's much more to it than that. And um, where is it? Um, uh, where does it follow? It's it starts like immediately after the um, the the testimonium. There's there comes this uh, story about Paulina. Right. There's the weird right. story that comes after the testimonium about this woman Paulina who is uh, tricked and seduced by a priest of Anubis. Um, uh, and it seems odd to many people, but it well, other noted connections. But. The connection, yeah. You, it's so you got to ask why. How does it fit? Right. Well, there's a virgin. There, there's a virgin that's right there. There's a virgin. A belief in a virgin birth is mentioned right there. Right, and of course, I mean, he's, Josephus is not endorsing it, but um, and he's talking about uh, so. So it's 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 Jewish history, right? So it's right. the story of Jesus, and then it's followed by the story of this Jewish teacher who has three followers who defraud a proselyte, right, Fulvia, right? So let me read it. There was a man who was a Jew, right, but had been driven away from his own country by an accusation laid against him for transgressing their laws. And by the fear, uh, he, he was under punishment for the same, but in all respects, a wicked man. He then, living at Rome, professed to instruct men in the wisdom of the laws of Moses. Uh, there's one scholar who thinks this is sort of a, a swipe at Paul. Uh, he procured also three other men entirely of the same character with himself to be his partners. These men persuaded Fulvia, a woman of great dignity and one that had embraced the Jewish religion to send purple and gold to the temple of Jerusalem. And when they had gotten them, they employed them for their own uses and spent the money themselves, on which account it was that they at first required it of her. Whereupon Tiberius, who had been informed of the thing by Saturnus, uh, Saturnus the husband of Fulvia, who desired inquiry might be made about it, ordered all the Jews to be banished out of Rome. At which time the consuls listed 4,000 men out of them and sent them to the island Sardinia, but punished a greater number of them who were unwilling uh, to become soldiers on account of keeping the laws of their forefathers. Thus were these Jews banished out of the city by the weakness of the four men. Um, all right, and so then there's the other story, right, um, a, a, about the pagan temple and the virgin stuff and all of that. 
I think that what's going on there, and there are, I think there are two or three scholars who've written about this, that these Josephus is adding that because these are subtle hints at the whole Jesus movement, the virgin birth story, uh, and and Paul uh, going to Rome, right, and getting a lot of money, right, losing money through, through donations, right, right, because of the house church <laughs> system that he developed, right, and the the uh, what do they call them, the uh, patrons, the patron system he had, right, um, so. Uh, even what goes after, right? If you take the testimonium out, none of that, none of that makes sense. Why would you see this put it there? It sounds out and of it's, yeah, yeah, and chronologically also, yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, it could be that Josephus is attacking Pauline Christianity uh, in these later, uh, the immediate references. Is that? Yeah, and when he talks about Jesus uh, gaining a lot of Je uh, Greeks as well as Jews, right? He's right. He's talking about recent, more recent events, events after the the life of th this Jesus, right? So, you know, the the more recent developments as well, which has been going on for you know a couple of decades by that by the time, well, more than a couple of decades, right? a few decades. All right, when he was writing the Antiquities. Uh, this is absolutely fascinating. So for various reasons, it sounds like, uh, Dr. Zinner, you're convinced that the testimonium is accurate as is, belongs where it belongs. The language could be uh, read negatively or at best neutrally. And so there's no reason to believe, in fact, because of the possible use in Luke, every good reason and the stories that follow it in the Antiquities, there's every good reason to believe that, in fact, it's genuine. Yeah, and if you that is to say, if you take it out, then the story about the pagan temple, the virgin birth, and uh, Fulvia and the proselytes, uh, uh, and all, uh, it, uh, it doesn't make sense. And the shift in the chronology, which goes on there, also doesn't make sense. Right? So it'd be very, very uh, suspicious, right? So if if you want to take out the testimonium, take out. Uh, the pagan temple story and and uh, and the uh, Fulvia, right? All of this, but anyway, um, it, it's very striking to me. Um, the the sentence before and the sentence after the testimonium. I mean, so why in the world would um, Christians want to insert it there if they created it? Mm. But well, it, it, anyway, uh, yeah. I, I don't think we should get worked up emotionally about this topic. I mean, it's it's right. a question of uh, you know of history and historical research. Right. So I think anyone who is finding themselves getting worked up about it should probably go out more often. <laughs> right. Well, as you say, I publicly mm -hmm. took the standard view that the testimonium was interpolated, and I'm having to rethink that. I have no particular dot. I need to go where the evidence leads me. And so I, you've given me more than enough reason to rethink my position that uh, the testimonium has been tampered with. Um, I just, yeah. I just, it's very fascinating. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I can't claim to have all the answers. I mean, as you know, it's a massive topic. Yeah. I mean, there's a massive amount of, of literature that's been written on this. Yeah. Uh, but I would refer people to Ulrich Victor. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you someone could if they don't know german just type it into google or something i don't know but it'd be a hell of a lot of typing but uh you know learn german so you can read ulrich victor's essay and get uh and read fernando bermejo rubio's essay right get us from, from the journal for the study of judaism uh you, 2014. and by the way anything by him you read it he has excellent articles on like um uh, John the Baptizer, what Josephus has to say about John the Baptizer, and how Christians have uh, c created this great gulf between John the Baptizer and Jesus, as if they were very different from each other, right, for, I guess, theological reasons. But anyway, anything, um, any essay uh, by Bermejo Rubio, uh, people should be reading his work, people interested in, like, this, his uh, question of the historical Jesus, um, especially Right. Um. You you brought up uh, Eisler, 
and you mentioned the Slavonic. Well, that was from a quote from 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 uh, that, that essay. Uh, well, may I ask, may I ask about your opinion on the Slavonic Josephus? Do you think it could be the original Aramaic version that Josephus mentioned of the Jewish wars? Well, you could uh, 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 not if you just uh, phrase it that way. We have to make a lot of qualifications. Now, the Slavonic version has definitely been interpolated, but uh, the happy circumstance is that because that translation was done, uh, you know, the, in, in the Middle Ages, the interpolations are, are uh, you don't have to w wonder, is this an interpolation, right? They're, they're absolutely clear, right? I mean, the, so, um, it, it, of course, it's interpolated, but um, let me see if I can find the name. It, it, I think it was the, the more uh, relatively recent uh, Blackwell Companion to Josephus, I think it is. There is a chapter in there uh, by... Um, Well, let's see. Let's see. Uh, it was a, like a, a father-daughter team, right? Who had uh, worked on the Slavonic Josephus. Uh, Henry uh, 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 Leeming, right, uh, was the father. Kate, that's her name. Kate Leeming. Um, she contributes a chapter in there uh, on the Slavonic Josephus, right? So this is as mainstream scholarship as you can get. Yes. Uh, but that's the version that, uh, right, um, that's just the text. And so the opinions expressed in the in the Brill uh, edition there of the text and the translation do not give you the actual opinions of Leeming, right? But those are in this chapter, uh, Kate Leeming, right? And she argues, uh, right, based on, you know, the work that her, her, her father had done, is that, yes, the Slavonic, Josephus is certainly interpolated, but it, it, the base of it is the original Aramaic or Hebrew edition of Josephus that he wrote for Jews. And uh, this is why throughout Slavonic Jesus, all those glosses that you find in the Greek Josephus are absent. Right, so uh, that's, just, that's not the only uh, powerful piece of evidence uh, for that claim. Right? There's also things like yeah, uh, the Slavonic Josephus describes John the Baptist, for instance, uh, as a, a rebel. A rebel. It's a, uh, basically, it's a clarity. The, the same language used of them in the Greek is, is used of uh, John the Baptizer uh, in there, right? So, uh, so and that makes a lot more sense, right, that uh, John the Baptizer would have been done in right, for, for seditious preaching. Right, just the way Jesus was, rather than, um, you know, this thing about adultery. And, and uh, you know, then we have the story about the beheading and all of this, which I think. I think that the portrait of the baptizer has been uh, cleaned up between the Jewish war and the antiquities. Yeah, uh, and there's a, a good article. I, I don't know if it's been published yet, but the author of it uh, sent it to me, I don't know, three, four five years ago, you know, how that time passes. Um, uh, it, it, I think it was a, 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 based on a paper he gave at an SBL conference. But anyway, he's, he's putting together the evidence uh, that the Gospel of Mark, I'm mentioning that because, right, he's the one with the story about John the Baptizer and the head getting cut off and all that. Uh, Mark, the Gospel of Mark uses the antiquities, right? So you're going to have to date Mark, you know, also late. Um, I would say close to 100, around there, right? And, um, but anyway, if you read the, the story about John the Baptizer in Josephus, you'll notice that immediately after, right, the, right, the very sentence after it starts this story, right, about Herod, and it mentions a, a beheading, but it's not the beheading of John the Baptizer. He doesn't mention the beheading of John the Baptizer. So it looks like John has sort of like take, I mean, Mark has taken that element of this story about Herod wanting the head of one of his military foes 
right, and uh, read it back into the story of John the Baptizer to create this story about you know, John the Baptizer being beheaded, which, uh, you know, it's not in Josephus. It's not found anywhere in Islamic uh, tradition. It's not found in the Mandaean sources, which are really, you know, strong on John the Baptizer. Right? So uh, anyway, um, I, I forget your question now. I don't know if I'm on a tangent there. Was a, do you think that the portraits in, of John the Baptizer in the antiquities, um, by the time we get to the antiquities, about 20 years later, do, do you think he's cleaned up the portrait of John the Baptist? In the Slavonic edition of Josephus, as you point out, he seems to be presented as a straightforward rebel, maybe a Sakari or something. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. By the time we get to antiquities, he seems like a good, noble, wise teacher who taught the love uh, commandments. And uh, do you think he's the portrait of the Baptist yeah. cleaned up by Josephus? Yeah, I think what's going on is. Uh, of course, you know, there are many of these uh, seditious uh, rebels uh, that Josephus, you know, plainly writes about negatively. Uh, but more than one scholar, you know, has raised this psychological issue, right? That Josephus, right, used to be on the other side, right? But he's, he's writing to please his, his Roman patrons and, and his... Roman overlords, right? And so he may have thought more positively about some of these figures, and John the Baptizer may have been uh, one of them. So I think that's what's going on with, with John the Baptizer, that uh, maybe he's suppressing, uh, you know, something there. For, for, to, for, for, to finish for, up on Slavonic for, Josephus, do you think Jesus was mentioned there, even though it was interpolated? Uh, it... Well, the Slavonic Josephus, right, is is the the, the not the antiquity; it's just the war, right? Uh, right, and yeah, there is an account there, but it's heavily interpolated. It's clearly interpolated, right? We don't have to argue about that. Clearly <laughs> interpolated, but uh, I think the bare bones of it there, what you see in there, uh, again, yeah, there was there was something in the addition that he made for his fellow country man right for his fellow jews he has something on, on jesus in there and of course there's right? nothing in contrast to the greek right in the greek version of the wars there's no mention of jesus at all well there there, there are several stories in the slavonic version uh, that are absent uh from the greek version so i mean there's no great mystery to that he was writing for a different audience and so he uh puts put certain things in there that uh, are going to appeal but be of more interest to a Jewish audience, right? And uh, there's, I forget the name of this woman, but there's a very, very unique story, very unique story in Slavonic uh, Josephus, totally absent from the Greek, uh, you know, so, but it has, it has every appearance of being from the pen of Josephus, every appearance of being an ancient uh, a, a account, ancient story, but it just didn't fit in. Well, uh, right for his plan for his his non-Jewish audience. It's hard to imagine a later Christian coming up with the story of the Pilate releasing Jesus and then rearresting Jesus, which sounds like it may be the origin of the Barabbas thing. But the point is that it's hard to. Imagine. Oh yeah, that other prophet, uh, the the woe prophet, uh, <clears throat> Jesus, uh, uh, the son of uh, Ananias, is it? Well, you we do have that, but we. we uh, well, that's the one where he's arrested and then released, sort of like uh, in the in, in one man. Well, you know, like in in the gospel story in in Matthew, right? Um, in one manuscript of Matthew, it's just like this Barabbas. It says it's Jesus Barabbas was his name, right? So um, in, in the Slavonic Josephus, J Jesus is initially arrested. By Pilate, this is in the Jewish oh, war. That's right. That's right. Uh, and he's released, uh, but then rearrested and killed. So uh, that's right. In effect, a release of a Jesus, uh, and that's nowhere to be found in canonical Christian literature. And it's hard for me to imagine a later Christian making that aspect up and inserting it into the Jewish wars. Yeah, and, it, and it, but it does bring to mind, you know, this thing about Jesus Barabbas. And, it sure and does. The release of some. Jesus, right? And the fact that uh, the story of Jesus and Ananias, 
that prophet of woe, right? If, right. if you oh, sure. look it's at fun. that, <laughs> that looks like it has shaped the wording of the story of the right. of Jesus, right? Well, and there was even even um, an evangelical conservative scholar who noticed that uh, at, at at some uh, respected. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, biblical scholarship conference years ago. Um, you know, it, it didn't necessarily because that, that doesn't necessarily have to mean right that the story of the passion of Jesus is just a fiction made out of that, right? But it, it's just the idea uh, on the part of that scholar that the idea was that well, you know, the wording of that story was you know used by Mark to good effect. Right to 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 help tell the story about Jesus. One comment I have to make here is it sure seems like the Gospels may be dependent. I mean, Mark and Luke, and could it be that all of our canonical Gospels are in fact aware of and use the works of Josephus? Well, Mark does. Um, Luke does. Matthew probably does, but it's I'm here in Italy. It's a, it's a little later, so I can't recall. Uh, but I'd be surprised if Matthew didn't. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, I'm, I'm yes. I, Matthew also knew knew because I, I think Matthew is being influenced by uh, Josephus' story about the nativity and birth and you know of Moses and applies that to Jesus. Right now, John. Uh, John also, yes. Like, in fact, John has a, I believe, an echo of the testimonium, right? Yeah. Right. You know what I'm referring to? Mm -hmm. Very right. fascinating. Right. So it's uh, it's uh, where is that line? Um, let me find it. Um, where it talks about. Um, let's see. Um, anyway, where it talks about the, the miraculous deeds and a thousand other, uh, right, yeah. thousands of these, right. right? So this sounds like um, um, something from Josephus. The testimony. Uh, and Any other it, it actually has an echo in two verses of the Quran also, actually. Uh, and, but it actually uh, actually goes back to a rabbinic tradition, actually. Um, so it's, it's a rabbinic maxim, right? That if if uh, you know if you had all the the water in the ocean, you know, and, and if all the trees were pens, right? You couldn't write all the wisdom of the Torah, right? Before that would be all depleted, right? And so that that is echoed twice in the Quran, but um, it. It really, I think, uh, it it all started there in this line from Josephus, and then it gets echoed by John, right? That Jesus did these and so many other deeds we could never, we could never, all the books in the world couldn't contain all these deeds, right? So I think it, it it's it's a reworking. So uh, not quite as confident about that, but I I really do suspect that John also would have known Josephus, but. But uh, I don't know. So what we have is early Christian literature, uh, second century, early second century Christian literature using Josephus, and yet we only get Josephus talked about by a Christian using the detailed testimonium material, presumably, at the time of Oregon. So the reason you, you would say that Christians didn't explicitly cite Josephus until that time would be because they thought it could be a totally negative reference. That could right. be negative or at least neutral or useless valence to them. Uh, and right. so they avoid quoting Josephus outright, even though they used him. Uh, and sometimes uh, some of these sources would not be of uh, polemical use uh, unless uh, someone were interacting with a Jewish community, right? Where you would have some of these stories like you find in, in in Kelsos, right? Right. Uh, right. So, uh, you know, if, if, if you just have uh, a lot of these uh, um, Greek speaking um, Christian leaders, right, 
if they're not in proximity to uh, and having a, a lot of you know theological uh, fights with Jews, right, and having to counter what the Jews are saying, then uh, you know there's less need to uh, you know to go to, to 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 deal with something like Josephus or to deal with like Kelsus, right? Uh, so anyway. If I were to try and make the best case, I guess, for those who would still argue that it's been tampered with, when Josephus mentions the, negatively these rebel leaders, and he does negatively mention several rebel leaders of the first century, he goes makes it quite clear that it's negative. Um, while it is true that the testimonium um, can be read in a subtle way by idiom to be negative, there isn't this direct denunciation of Jesus either, which we expect, say, for John, uh, for Judas the Galilean or for the Egyptian rebel or uh, other rebel figures that Josephus talks about. Uh, I don't know. I think, I, I think that depends on how you you um, read uh, the, the Greek text, right? Because uh, he's, he's um, right... Um, he led astray many Jews and many of the Greeks, right? And, uh, it's just that, uh, right, uh, as, as for what he has to report, um, Jesus, right, is, yeah, the, the trope that he's using here is, right, so we have, he has these seditious leaders, right, that he likes to condemn, right, right. Uh, like the Egyptian authors. But right. the, here, the trope that we have here is a trope that you then find uh, already, like in Kelsus, and then which becomes uh, predominant, uh, right, in the early literature. And that is the trope of the false prophet, the seducer of the people. And this uh, is more serious f for Josephus than the s sedition that Jesus may have uh, engaged in, right, which, right got him crucified so there was obviously that part of it but for josephus what was egregious was uh, that he, he he this movement has deceived so many jews and uh, especially the greeks and it's it's a movement that's still there still still existing and so it is a danger right and so this is what he's concentrating on because these other seditious leaders when they got killed their movements ended there was no, there was no enduring danger, right, for for his, for Jews or, or or the Romans, right. So this is the difference, and I think this is why he doesn't go into any details about the sedition. But he he doesn't have to. If you read the antiquities, if you read the Jewish uh, war, right, you anyone who has read it will know that uh, will know why people got crucified, right. It was seditious, but that's you know that that's that wasn't uh, the most important part of the story of Jesus for Josephus. It was that he led astray so many people, and so many people have are still being led astray. And crucifixion itself might have implied Jews and Greeks, and crucifixion by itself might have implied something negative already that he didn't well, need detail. Clearly, I mean, throughout the he, he he you're right. This is not the only place he mentions crucifixion. So you know, when you read Josephus, any reader of Josephus knows what crucifixion is a punishment for. It's for sedition. Well, sir, I yeah, I've given my best my best shot at trying to at, uh, to, to to answer you. I think you make a powerful, powerful argument, sir. And I want to thank you, the, 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 Jacob. This, those were all the questions I had, but I want to thank you for a very powerful uh, presentation. And I think it should get people to uh, relook at the antiquities in a whole new light, especially those who are familiar with Koine Greek. Consider those idioms. This could be a totally negative or totally neutral at best passage. So there's really no reason in the first instance to think that Christians tampered with it. Yeah, well, as I say, like you, 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 uh, go to uh, go to Bermejo Rubio's essay. Those who want to read more, uh, as I say, there there are like I think two of the points right uh, uh, of Ulrich that is not convinced on, right? But um, you know, it was like 80, 90 percent of it, right? He's he's like he's he's pointing out 
right through these parallels that yeah this really looks negative if you read uh, you know of course clearly uh, Bermejo Rubio has used a concordance right and actually spent the time to look up the the passages where these terms are used elsewhere in Josephus and that's that really paid off it really paid off right so, People need to be aware that the phrases that are used in the testimonium are very frequently used in a negative context by Josephus. Um, There's a couple of super chats I've been waiting a while, so I'm going to take mm -hmm. them real quick. Mr. Warlike, thank you for your super chat. Is Josephus' mention of James the Just in Book 20 of Antiquities viable? David Harfield is one scholar who theorizes that Christian scribes turned James, a brother of high priest Jesus Ben Damnius, into the biblical James. I think that's nonsense. You want to talk about natural uh, Josephus use of language. If, if in fact it's the son of Damnius that's being confused, then why would he repeat the phrase son of Damnius, the identifier? It would be the only time in all of Josephus's work where he repeats the specific identifier until and unless he introduces a person of the same name, another James or another Jesus, there'd be no reason to modify, uh, to repeat the son of Damnius modifier which is presumably would have been in the original above the the, the passage, the section that uh, says Jesus, son of Damnius, was then appointed high priest. So I think there's not only that, but I think there's good reason internal construction wise to uh, have every belief that the James passage is as is. Notice the neutral phrase, the, the we often translate the so-called James, the brother of the so-called or aforementioned or had been called Christ, something like that. Uh, that's a rather neutral phrase that one wouldn't expect from a Christian interpolator. So I have all kinds of uh, reasons. Uh, James is downplayed in second century Christian literature, uh, it, it seems to me. And so there'd be no reason to interpolate a James passage if you were a later Christian in any event. So for various reasons, I think the James passage is genuine. I think the arguments against it have been made largely by mythicists who do have a bias to read Jesus altogether out of Josephus. And further, I'll go further, I think that the James passage could in fact imply since he's identifying James by this Jesus who was called the Christ, that could imply a, another mention, a previous mention of a guy, Jesus, who had been called the Christ earlier in the work of Josephus. That's my yeah, I, I think the uh, opinion usually is, is that the passage is not interpolated, but the names have been played around with, right? And it's been turned into a, a story about the death of James, the, the brother of Jesus. Um, the brother uh, of Jesus, the one who is you all call, you've heard called Christ. Again, not a title, not a t messianic title, but a personal name, right? Because that's how Greeks were using it, right? as I explained earlier. So, but I, yeah, I don't see any reason to 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 uh, amend the text or to see that something has been. Uh, change, but of course I would think that, right? So if I think, uh, you know, that that uh, we have an integral text of the testimonium, then you know, well, I mean, there, there's really no problem. But I know some people don't even want James uh, to exist as a brother of Jesus, right? So they they take that in a spiritual sense in the the letter to the Galatians, right? James, a brother of the Lord as if he's right because well all christians are called brother of the lord well then why is no one else called the brother of the lord the brother of the lord right uh but just him so anyway jc thank you for your super chat what were josephus's sources of events before his adulthood how did so much of judas the galilean's actions per josephus end up as jesus's in gospels Okay, before his adulthood, before Josephus was an adult, you know, events that happened before he was an adult, I think that's what he said, all right. Well, he had a lot of, uh, when, he, when he was writing all this, right, he had access to all types of Roman archives, right? So that's where sources were. Of course, he was also an eyewitness to a lot of events. He, uh, in his adulthood, that is. He's an interesting autobiographical assertion. He says that when Titus sacks uh, Jerusalem, he is entrusted 
with all of the sacred documents that were recovered uh, from the temple. He further tells us that he has access to Vespasian's own uh, common, you know, memoirs about the war. And working for the Flavians, we can see, as it was just pointed out, he must have had access to all the Roman records. So we can only presume that he had multiple sources, both official Roman sources, as well as whatever uh, Jewish literature was recovered from Jerusalem at the sack of Jerusalem. Right, and uh, why would d details of other people like Judas the Galilean be applied to Jesus? Well, I mean, it, it, we can call it figural, typological, right? just as I mentioned, the story of uh, Josephus account of Moses' uh, birth, right, and infancy, right, uh, Matthew applies that to the story of, of Jesus' infancy. Well, of course, there's a, there's a, for Matthew, there's a, there's a theological typology there. He's, he's already presenting Jesus as his new Moses, right? So, they're, they're, you know, that's one reason why, you know, that kind of maneuver would be made. Well, I think we I think we can close right there. And I just want to say real quick, um, thank you for joining me today, Dr. Samuel Zinner and James Valiant. Sure. Thank you to people, to people that watch this video and a couple of super chats that we've got. Thank and, you, Senator. You know, it's a wonderful conversation. I very much appreciate it. You know, anytime. anytime. My pleasure. Thanks again. All right. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.